Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 203, recorded on August 22nd, 2021. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes, from a really warm, sunny, beautiful Parker, Colorado, just outside of Denver. Let's do the news. We wanted to start this week by giving you an idea of what's coming soon in the Linux desktop pipeline. It's been another busy week over at KDE, and developer Nate Graham has once again done a great job helping us wrap our heads around some of the more notable bits. I know the work on the new overview effect caught Chris's attention in particular. Indeed, this is looking really great. It's a new QML-based overview effect, and Nate stresses in his post, this is still kind of early days, it's still going to need some testing, But the idea is to give you one spot that gives an overview of all the relevant window functionality, similar to a third-party KWIN script that already exists called Parachute, and also somewhat similar to how macOS's mission control works today. It's going to ship in Plasma 5.23, and they're going to want everybody to take a look at it, but this is the way they're going, a new way to do this, and they'd like everybody to get some eyes on it. Also, another feature that caught my attention that made me think, How did we not have this before? But now in KDE system settings, you can choose the status of your Bluetooth adapter at login. So if you want it to be powered on when you log in or powered off, perhaps, or how about just whatever the last state was, that'll now be an option you can control. And like nearly every recent release, work has gone into making the Wayland experience better. In the Plasma Wayland session, middle click paste now works between native Wayland apps and those running under X Wayland. Among several other fixes, one I was happy to see is the resolution of at least one of the ways that the lock screen could get broken on Wayland. In a relatively new ongoing update series, Felix Hacker filled us in on the road to GNOME 41. And speaking of new system settings, there's two new panels that have landed in GNOME. One is multitasking and the other is cellular. The multitasking panel provides helpful functionality to improve your productivity when working with many apps at once with some nice options there. And the cellular panel allows you to configure various aspects of a mobile connection and a mobile modem. Many of the GNOME supporting apps are seeing updates land as well, including the podcast app for GNOME that now supports an episode description page where users can read the notes for an episode, full titles of long episode names, and share the episode URL. And when many of us think of shipping the GNOME desktop, we think of Ubuntu, which normally ships with the latest GNOME desktop version that's generally released just before Ubuntu ships. Well, with Ubuntu 2104, they ended up sticking with GNOME 338 rather than jumping on GNOME 40 just as it was released. Now, interestingly, Michael Larbel over at Pharonix notes that he's been looking at the development track of Ubuntu 2104 And it looks like they're going to opt to stick with GNOME 40 and not GNOME 41, which will be released by then. GNOME 41 will be out in September, as usual, with the latest and greatest from the half-year update. When asked about Ubuntu's GNOME version plans, Canonical's Sebastian Blachet wrote, Ideally, we would have updated to 41, but future freeze is today, and we didn't really have the resources available for the update. And while that's really a shame to see, it seems that maybe Canonical will cherry-pick a few features to backport to 40. And GNOME 41 is currently up to a beta state right now. A release candidate is coming in early September, and the official GNOME 41 release is planned for September 22nd. Sticking with GTK, but shifting away from GNOME, after 18 months of development, Mate 1.26 has been released. 126 introduces Wayland support for Atro, System Monitor, Pluma, Terminal, and a host of other desktop components. And an area that saw a lot of development that you might not expect at first pass is actually Mate's text editor, Pluma. It was subject to massive improvements, and just a few of those are the new mini-map that gives you an instant overview of a large dock, the new grid background pattern that turns Pluma into a writing pad, and, of course, the preference dialog that had to get pretty much reworked to accommodate a bunch of new features. I mean, they've really invested in Pluma this release cycle. The project seems pretty darn proud of this work, and notes in particular that together with the brand new Pluma plugins, The text editor can now be turned into a feature-rich IDE with support for things like bracket completion, commenting and uncommenting of code blocks, a built-in terminal, and, of course, autocomplete. And as always, but especially after 18 months, this really, really rings true. The project has just fixed a lot of bugs, some memory leaks, and has modernized the code base of just about all of their desktop components. It really looks like Mate 126 is a banger release. 
Matrix, the open standard and protocol for real-time communication released six years ago, has many clients under active development. But one of the largest, Element, saw a significant update this week. Yes, it did. Version 1.8, among other things, has introduced voice message support. And the project says this is going to be first-class support across all major platforms. On mobile, you can use the new voice message button two different ways. Either press and hold to instantly send a message, or drag the button up to lock the recorder on if you're sending a longer message and don't want to have to hold the button down the whole darn time. After that, you can review the message you've recorded before you send it off. Hey Wes, this is my first Element voice message, and it's so warm here in the Parker area that I think my iPad's going to melt. So let me know if you got this, okay? And of course, it's easy to issue a quick reply. And on the desktop, you just click the microphone button and you just do your thing. Well, I'm recording from a very cool and cloudy Pacific Northwest. Joke's on you, Chris. You should have flown back with me. And probably worth noting here, the Element Project said that this has been one of their oldest and most upvoted feature requests ever. It is really nice to see, and I think it might help it be a little more competitive against some of those proprietary chat clients out there. And even better, when we dug into it, we were so pleased to see that they're using Opus wrapped in an AUG container to actually send the audio bits around. It's so nice to see open source audio being used for what it's best at. And really, besides voice messages, a ton of improvements for voice and video calls have landed as well. If you've tried that stuff out in the past, now is definitely the time to give it another go. Yeah, it seems like a lot of underhood improvements. They said that they did a lot of rework to update to more current matrix specs that make VoIP calls a lot more robust. That was an aspect they sort of underlined and said, please give that a go if you haven't used that before. If you used it in the past and thought it didn't work great, try it again. They also just really cleaned up the chat timeline with just how images are displayed, how replies and red receipts are displayed, and the entire experience of the core chat has been improved. And when isn't that a big win in the chat application? So if you'd like to join our Matrix server, head over to linuxunplugged.com slash matrix, and it'll send you there. And just a brief update on the Tenacity Project, a community fork of Audacity with quite a bit of momentum. The developer has posted an update for distribution packagers that lets them know about some of the big changes to Tenacity's build system, what they might need to do for pipewire support, and a lot more. And buried in that post are some details that indicate ongoing work to update Tenacity's window toolkit, WX Widgets, to a newer version. The project's lead, called Bean, has also gone the extra mile by making sure the ecosystem of libraries around Tenacity are in good shape, effectively becoming the new upstream for some of them. It seems work is proceeding well, with some of the hardest parts already tackled. But Bean notes the project is not yet ready to be packaged. There's still rebranding work to do to remove those Audacity trademarks. Leno.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and you go there to support this show. This show is made possible by our sponsors like Linode. And Linode is where we host pretty much everything now, and definitely everything we've built in the last two and a half years. They started in 2003, so 18 years ago. Uh, I've known about them for a long time because I've seen them at community events, but I really got a new appreciation of what it's like to work with Linode as a business. Because you can use somebody's services, you can check out their website, but you don't get a sense of what they really are like internally until you've had an opportunity to do something like we just did, which was our Denver meetup. What an opportunity. I, I, I really am so grateful for Linode's support. They brought our community together. They, they created something special. We gave away uh, a set of Raspberry Pis, and it couldn't have worked out better because one of our first winners for the Raspberry Pis was Jose, who flew in from Puerto Rico. And Jose is working on accessibility for Linux. He's a blind developer himself. He flew by himself from Puerto Rico to our meetup, and he was the first winner of the Raspberry Pi giveaway kit that Linode did. And it just, it was like, it made that moment so perfect. And it was, it was really special. And that wouldn't have happened without Linode's support. And 
on top of just being a great company with great people inside it, they've got Linux geeks in there that have built an awesome product because they knew where Linux was going back in 2003. And they saw, geez, you know, instead of racking a server for every Apache box, we could start using this user mode Linux stuff that's going towards virtualization and actually create multiple Linux servers on one host. That was their big breakthrough back in the day. That's They were first in this, and now they're doing it the best. They're still independently owned. They have 11 data centers around the world. They are their own ISP, so the interlinks between their data centers are crazy fast. We use the heck out of their S3-compatible object storage. You can as well. They're currently testing out bare metal boxes just because sometimes that's the way you got to go. DDoS protection, VLAN support, a powerful DNS manager, that's all in there as well. And with pricing 30 to 50% cheaper than other major cloud providers, and the fact that you can support Linux Action News by going to linode.com slash LAN, I mean, it seems like a great opportunity. Even if you just wanted to try something out, deploy something, compare it to another provider, or maybe learn something. They have a bunch of tutorials that can help you do that, and they also have a marketplace of applications. And while I don't... I don't generally tend to deploy the entire application stack with the eventual application installed. I do tend to deploy like their base stacks with the correct repos for whatever I might be using, generally Docker, because you can click that and get that going in no time. And then you just jump in, make sure everything's up to date. It usually is. And they, oh, oh, and the other nice thing is, is Linode has a mirror of the distro repos packages. So you're updating over Linode's crazy fast LAN. And then their boxes are super fast and the SSDs are super fast. So it's a blast <laughs> updating your boxes on Linode. Uh, and if you ever get stuck, they have the best customer support uh, by phone, by ticket, however you like to do it. They'll hook you up with great, great customer support. Linode is dedicated to offering the very best in virtualized cloud computing. If it runs on Linux, it'll run on Linode. So go sign up today and support the show. Linode.com slash LAN. Linux.ting.com. Linux Action News is also brought to you by Ting. And if you're sick of overpaying for cell service, go see how much you could save and then take 25 bucks off that at Linux.ting.com. Ting is an MBNO or a mobile virtual network operator. That means they're not digging big holes and installing towers and arguing with local governments. They don't have to focus on that stuff. Instead, they can focus on making a great value for their customers and great customer service. With Ting Mobile, you get the same coast-to-coast -coast coverage as you would with all the big networks. You just pay less for it. That's why I've been a Ting customer since 2013. And on this road trip, I've had an opportunity to chat with customers of Ting that have listened to our show and signed up for Ting. And one of the use cases that I never really considered, because I'm always traveling by land, is people who fly into a certain area love to use Ting for when they're traveling. So um, a, a common one was people who come in from out of country. They can have a Ting SIM in the United States, but also people who are just traveling out of their area and want to pick something that is better in that area that they're traveling to. Because with Ting, you have multiple networks. And if you work with their support, you can get the right SIM card so you end up getting the best type of coverage for your area. And they have really easy plans and simple to understand that make it a great value for using Ting like that. But they also have plans that just work great for families. You know, if you, if you just sync your music and you sync your podcast before you get started, it'll blow your mind, the kind of savings you can get compared to like the big duopolies. Like the kind of service you might get with a big duopoly, you're probably going to be paying on a family plan like, I don't know, over $100, $130, where with Ting, they have like the set 12 plan. You get 12 gigs of data and unlimited talk and text. So the stuff that really matters, and that's $35 a month. So it's like $100 less a month. And it's really easy to add lines as you need it, and you can pool that data. So it's just really worth looking at if you just use a little bit of outside the box thinking when it comes to mobile. Two gigs, 20 gigs, or even more, there's going to be a Ting plan for you. So go get clever. And then you get access to Ting's award-winning customer service when you sign up, their nationwide LTE and 5G coverage. And the best part is no contracts ever. And it's funny, I've been a customer since 2013. And I think ironically, one of the reasons I stick around is because there is no contract. There's no like agreement as the carriers call it now. They, they don't like calling it contracts. No, no, but they call it agreement. And there's no agreement like looming over my head. It's clean, it's straightforward, it's simple. And you can get started by going to linux.ting.com. Go check your current phone, create an account, pick the plan that's right for you. Ting will send you a SIM, you pop it in, you're up and going in minutes. 
The next generation of Ting Mobile is here. So go see how much you could save and then take 25 bucks off that. Linux.ting.com. This past week, we had the absolute privilege of spending some time at the System76 factory in Denver, Colorado. During our time there, we had a chance to chat with founder and CEO Carl Rochelle. The entire chat was featured in Linux Unplugged 419, but there was a bit where Carl made some news. Yeah, it's a bit of exclusive information, so we wanted to let you know about it here. I asked Carl if we were ever going to see a $100 version of their customizable open launch keyboard. And that got us chatting about the roadmap in general for the launch. And Carl, like an open book that he is, shared some never released details about their future plans. There is a roadmap for launch. It just doesn't go down to 100. Mm. Um, and we, I don't think that we can build a product that we would be proud of um, um, that fits with the the design and the characteristics of launch itself. We don't want the quality to be any lower, but there are things that we can do to bring the price down for another model. So um, the launch roadmap includes a model that's going to have a 10 key numpad. So ah, that'll be coming. Cool. I think uh, both of these are probably first half next year. So a 10 key, well, we've got to get a production up and running. Sure. Right? Yeah. And uh, I caught up, but the 10 key and then another smaller, I believe it's 67 key which is going to remove the F row. Uh, so you'd fa- you'd hit the function row underneath the function key with one, two, three, and so forth. Right? So an even smaller footprint. Right, an even smaller one. Um, so that cuts out a bunch of switches. We're also going to remove the hub from that. And my hope is we can get that to, to 199. Besides future keyboard plans, Carl is also pretty open about their ambitions to build a laptop, a topic we'll have some information on sometime soon. And really, it just seems like System76 is in a great location for what they're doing. I was blown away by the number of Denver locals who showed up at our meetup. I mean, everyone from new Linux users who had just found the shows to folks who have been doing software development on Linux for way longer than they would ever like me to say on air. The Linux tech scene in general was impressive in Denver. I think way more than either of us were expecting. Yeah, I would agree with that. I I don't know what I was expecting going into it exactly, but like you mentioned, there was some folks there that were just learning Linux and they had just traveled to the area and got Linux jobs. And then there was folks that had been there for a long time. And it was a good mix of like, just arrived, the tech scene's growing. It seems like it's on a heck of a trajectory. I think we're going to have to return someday. And I think there's going to be a lot of developments out there with all of those people getting these Linux jobs. So Check out linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes because we'll cover everything that happens in the world of Linux and open source. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to keep in touch. And stay tuned for some exclusive content that we recorded during our trip. We'll have more details on that really soon. As for us, we'll be back next Monday with our weekly take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week. (laughs) 